Um, Carl Venters was born in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, 1933. My father was a, an attorney from Richlands, North Carolina. When he graduated from UNC Law School, there were no jobs during the beginning of the Depression, so he moved to, New, to Long Island, New York, or New York City. So, and there I grew up and lived there until I was 10 years old. And so I was, uh, would visit North Carolina where all my family, their family was, was, you know, every summer. But I was a real, real Yankee. And then uh, uh, we moved back to North Carolina at the end of World War II. My father wanted to come back home. And so he came back to Jacksonville, North Carolina, in Oslo County, and opened up a law office. My mother was his secretary. And at that point in time, I was back in North Carolina. So at that time, when you moved to Jacksonville, were you in junior high, high school? No, I was in the uh, 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 seventh grade. Seventh grade, yeah. Uh -huh, yeah. I guess they call that junior high or middle school now, seventh grade. Yeah, so that's right. You'd been about, what, 12, 13 years old. Yeah. yeah. So, and when did you start getting interested in broadcasting or any kind of media? Well, while I was in uh, living in Great Neck, Long Island, a good friend of my father's was the announcer on a CBS radio show called Let's Pretend, a kid's show on Saturday mornings. Everything, of course, in those days was live. There was no tape. And he would bring me into New York City, and I would attend the broadcast. And, of course, they had a live audience, and he would be the announcer. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to be a CBS announcer and read in front of that microphone. Wow. And he would give me the scripts. I would take them home, and I'd get another friend and I, we would read the, the scripts. And that's how I got real interested in, in broadcasting. Well, and then you moved away. You moved to Jacksonville. So how did you pick it back up from there? Well, in Jacksonville, uh, the town at the time was 3,000 people, but it was the home of Camp Lejeune Marine Base. World War II was just over, and they had decided that they would not close the Marine Base. That's one of the reasons my father decided to move back to Jacksonville. Well, in those days, there was really nothing to hear and nothing to see before television. Then the small little community radio stations began to pop up. In Jacksonville, it was WJNC, 1240 AM on your dial. And I began to hang around there, oh, when I was 13, 14 years old. And I would practice and Pretty soon, I got a little summer two-hour high school uh, gig on WJNC. Then pretty soon, I worked my way into being an afternoon announcer. Now, in those days, it was not all music. These were network radio stations in those days. Major League Baseball every day, some soap operas. And as an announcer, you just did the breaks in between and whatever. Then, later on, music began to become very popular uh, on radio stations, only a little bit at a time. So I talked the owner into letting me do a music uh, afternoon show. Of course, I was, not, I was in the ninth grade or tenth grade in high school then, and I was cool because I was the guy playing all the music. Now, of course, I got the music list from all the girls in school. And, of course, the owner and the manager couldn't stand all that, that new kind of music. It was, I mean, it was just boogie and all that kind of thing. So I became a disc jockey and worked there and went to uh, all the way through high school. Then I just went off to uh, UNC, Chapel Hill, uh, to then, yes, major in radio, TV, and motion pictures, which they had just started, I think, at that time. And so that was the beginning of my interest in broadcasting. I was going to be a, a uh, career broadcaster. Well, you, uh, you fit right in. You uh, quickly got um, some interesting alignments and jobs with uh, the media at UNC Chapel Hill. Tell us about that. Well, in Chapel Hill at the time, they had a, the uh, uh, 
WUNC FM. That was way before FM, but WBT in Charlotte had given the university one of their old original FM transmitters as they began to upgrade. Now this is, this is 1952. And um, it went on the air, 91.5, and it became sort of a practice or a student radio station because we had a transmitter and we had qualified engineers and we started doing programming. John Young was the professor who was heading that up. And we all began to go to work and I had to learn classical music. I mean, I had to learn how to pronounce Bach and <laughs> all, we had no idea what that was. But we began to program it. And then by the time I was a junior, um, uh, I became, well, as a senior, I became the station manager. And we had a very good uh, programming uh, uh, effort then. We taped, uh, recorded, because we had tape recorders now. We had uh, began to get tape recorders. And we'd go to the concerts in the music school, tape uh, a cello concert, bring it back, put it on the air. And I would announce also uh, the classical music, which I had a hard time doing, and everybody did. But uh, my news director was Carl Castle. And Carl Castle was, uh, became, you know, the, the number one news guy at NPR radio. Also in my class was a guy named Charles Carroll. And I can remember being in a studio one day to a, audition for a, a script show. And I was sitting next to this guy, and I introduced myself to him. And, I, and he introduced himself, and he said, Hello, my name is Charles Carroll. <laughs> I'm from Charlotte. And I knew right then I would not get that, that, uh, that job. And I didn't. So and Charles and I remained, and he was on the radio station. But then his interest went toward uh, uh, print, toward journalism because Ed Murrow had chosen him as one of his protégés while he was in uh, a freshman at, at, at Carolina. So where was Ed Murrow at that time? He was at CBS. Okay. He, yeah, he was doing... And he was reaching out to students yeah, that yeah. he saw and bringing them along. And he was doing his famous sh interview shows at that time and doing a lot of news. And Charles Carroll was being groomed to come up there really to take over the evening news later. But first, they wanted him to have journalism experience, so he became the editor of the UNC Daily Tar Heel newspaper. So he was the editor of the newspaper. I was the manager of the radio station, so we controlled the media. <laughs> <laughs> Although we didn't, we, we had a, a good deal of news on UNC TV, and Wade Hargrove, as you heard, uh, came later to become the news director for at WNC uh, FM. So you were the you were the station manager, and uh, you had some uh, what later on became pretty notable employees. Your news director was Wade Hargrove, um, and you had mix-ins with uh, Charles Carrault and other people that oh, were yeah. students and, in your uh, classes. Right. Yeah. Carl, Carl Castle. Carl Castle. Uh, yeah. I know. So we we really had a very talented people mm -hmm. coming along, and um, the department uh, uh, graduated a lot of really good people at that time. So that was my experience, but I was working in the summers back in Jacksonville. Um, so I got, you know, commercial radio experience. So you worked there as well. Now, you also had an association with UNC TV. Was that before or after that you uh, went to the service? Can I do this? Mm hmm Well, in my senior year, UNC TV, Channel 4 went on the air as an educational television station. That's what they called them those days. What year would that have been? Uh, 54. And everybody wanted to certainly know about television, so I went to work part-time dragging cables and doing audio and that kind of thing, even while I was station manager of the FM station, because I wanted TV experience. And then it was time to graduate and I had joined the Air Force ROTC in order to not be drafted to go to Korea. Um, 
And when I got through my senior year, the Air Force suddenly cut uh, the number of people they wanted as pilots and said, so, well, you're not going to be a pilot, you're going to be something else. And I said, no, I don't want to. I want to be up front. So I wandered around for a day or two and joined the Marine Corps, went to OCS and became a Marine Corps officer. So now, though, the Marine Corps didn't have any broadcast facilities that I could go to work at, but they knew uh, that I was interested in that and they made me a communication officer and uh, sent me my first duty station after nine months of tough tra officer training in Quantico, Virginia, sent me to Miami, Florida to the Marine Corps Air Station and as a communication officer and I was a top secret crypto officer. And what does that mean? That means that I received all the, uh, me and some others, uh, received all the messages from the Department of the Navy, from the Marine Corps, whatever. They were top secret and they were encrypted. And I would get them and have to go into a vault and go into a crypto machine and break them. And they told me, if you ever carry one of these top secret messages out of this building, you'll go to jail for the rest of your life. <laughs> That's quite a deterrent. <laughs> uh, quite different from these days. <laughs> anyway. But uh, while I was in there, I mean, I was working 24-hour shifts. So I was off three days and I had to work 24 hours. So I had time. So what do I do? I went over to Miami Beach, South Beach. And there's an AM radio station over there and I convinced them to hire me as a, an announcer. What were the call letters? Do you remember? I'm afraid that I can't remember right now. So you were an announcer on a Miami radio yeah, station, yeah. and uh, you ran into some notable folks while you were engaged well, in Well, Larry King worked there, Okay. and so I would work the night shift, not every night, of course, but uh, uh, during the week, and I was a part-timer. At 9 o'clock, I'd say, now from the Lincoln Road restaurant, here's Larry King. Tonight he's going to interview Frank Sinatra, because all those big names were down in Miami Beach at that time. So it was not unusual for Frank Sinatra or other big name entertainers to be no. in town and Larry would interview them and yeah. you would introduce Larry. And that's how he got started. The Fontainebleau uh, Hotel had just opened up and one other and all those famous people went down there. That's how Larry and I are exactly the same age, even with the same month. And so he would go over there and get them and take them to this restaurant and that was, you know, or the early days of remotes, and I'd be back in the studio, and he'd interview them, and that's how he got started. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Then the Marines closed down the air station, and I had to go to another duty station. So that was the only radio time I had while I was in the Marine Corps. What years would that have been, Carl? That was uh, 56 uh, to 60. Through 60. So, 1960, you get discharged from the Marines? Yeah. Uh -huh. And what happened then? Well, the interesting thing was I didn't have a job. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I had uh, uh, auditioned to be a news guy at WTVD Channel 11 in Durham and didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was, I was really worried. Well, John Young, who had run the FM station as a professor, he now was the manager of Channel 4 WNC TV, full time. And he called me and said, Carl, I'd like you to come up and be program director. I said, program director? Uh, I'm not sure I'm qualified, but I'm, I'll be there. <laughs> and so I moved to Chapel Hill and began my job. And he left to go on a, uh, a mission somewhere for a long time. We had no manager. So two or three of us, John Hawes, myself, a couple others, we sort of ran the station. And that's when I met Wade. And all we did, it was, it was just a bunch of guys. We had more fun going to the control room. To, it was all live TV. And what did Wade Hargrove do at UNC TV then? He was, he was a, a cameraman, and he did some voice, uh, some booth announcing, I remember. And um, we began to do some uh, basketball broadcasts, telecasts for uh, C.D. Chesley, who really started ACC basketball Saturday afternoon coverage. 
We had the only remote bus in the state, well equipped, and he would rent it from us and our crew. And, and, and all of us worked on a lot of the games. We would go to the games and become assistant directors and whatever. And that's how ACC basketball started. Now, wasn't uh, radio really worried about TV at that time? Yes, it was. And didn't they, in fact, put some limitations on you about the games early on? Well, they said um, it was more of a political thing, I think, in North Carolina. Uh, some of the games have been always broadcast on WPTF and WRAL radio. Big coverage, 50,000 clear watt. You yeah, could and, hear them forever. And it's, it's small networks I mean, yeah. all over the state. And they kept saying, now, wait a minute, if you guys come on and start doing television, what's going to happen to our radio broadcast? They're going to go away. So they came up with the idea of, of allowing us to do the, the television, but the radio stations provided the play-by-play. The, uh, -play. Yeah, so you did the, the pictures, but they wouldn't let you do the yeah. sound. And somebody had gotten it through the commission, as long as we... Uh, as long as we produced a little bit of crowd noise, that we were a legitimate TV broadcast. And the people still would then tune into Ray Reeves and others on their radio and listen to the good play by play. Well, then Woody Durham came along, and Woody was, came to work as a student at uh, UNC TV, and we became good friends, and we began to do. Uh, television broadcasts of the UNC football games. Now the way we, only way we could do it, because we couldn't, didn't have the remote facility, we couldn't use the remote facilities. For, for that we didn't have the money. So we would go and Woody would come, go up in the sports booth and he would do the play-by-play -play and practice, to learn how to do play-by-play. -play. But then what we ended up doing is we got the game films and we took the game films back on Sunday nights and we put them on the air and I put Woody out in the studio in front of a TV monitor and he would watch the game films and he had the play runs in front of him. He'd say, it's now third down, quarterback's going to take the ball and did play by play and we read and crowd noise and cheering and we did that every Sunday night for a couple of years. And that was after the game actually had happened, but it was fascinating to watch yeah, on TV? Yeah, the game had happened on Saturday afternoon. Yeah. This was Sunday night. <laughs> but and, that was very popular. Yeah, and that's how Woody Durham uh, got into the sports. They became yeah. one of our, our best sportscaster. So then we decided, you know, we got a full-blown VHF TV station that, um, by the way, Capital Broadcasting had allowed us to have and I don't mean that in a sarcastic way, the fact that they got a, a VHF channel to be educational kept out another commercial channel. There's only three channels allocated to each city, VHF, and five and 11 were allocated to Raleigh and Durham, and four to Chapel Hill to be educational. So that was, I mean, everything sort of work out for us. But here we are, one of the three VHF uh, channels. We decided we'd do a newscast, like everybody else. So we had a newscast, we had a news anchor. Woody was the sports director. I did the weather. And about what year would this have been? Pardon? What year would this have been? This would have been 59. So the late 50s. And, and, and Wade Hargrove, I think you were operated the camera on some of those. We didn't do that very long, I don't believe. I had left in uh, 60. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much longer we did it. Um, Tell us about your weather cast. How, what about weather graphics? Well, we had no grant. We had no graph. Mm -hmm. uh, we, had no, we had nothing. I mean, you know, didn't have any videotape. Uh, it, we couldn't run eight, we could run eight millimeter, but you know, the frames per second didn't match. What about uh, weather maps and things? How did you handle that? Well, I had a big whiteboard. I had a big black uh, pencil. Yeah, well, pe yeah, pen. And I would say, now here's the weather. Now here are the clouds <laughs> moving in over the mountains. 
and they're moving in over here, and that's what we did. I'd say, now it's going to rain, I'd paint some raindrops down, and then review the actual forecast from Associated Press, you know, the, the, the actual weather forecast. But I would try to draw it, and that would work fine until I came home, um, oh, several months later, and some of my neighbors came over and said, Carl, we watch your weather every night. You've got to quit throwing those pictures. Look like they look like women's breasts. <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of that. <laughs> and so the news that you had was, I guess, what they call rip and read. Associated yeah, yeah. Press. Well, for, we had, we had yeah. uh, news that was uh, uh, of the university that WNC FM used and we used as well. But again, we had no video, so we, we took some stills. Did a lot of stills, and uh, you just put them up on on a, on, a, on a screen, put a camera on them, and that was the way you did it in those days. Wow! So, what made you leave UNC TV? Well, at that point in time, the radio business was beginning to have make a comeback, sort of, sort of. Television was sort of putting it out of business. Everybody thought. And so, uh, uh, another fellow in the, in the uh, company, way, I mean, uh, uh, decided that maybe, let, let's go in business. Let's buy a radio station. And we said, well, I mean, how do you buy a radio station? And, but a, little, a bunch of them had been built, just like I said earlier, little small AMs in small towns. And people were trying to operate them. Some were successful. Some weren't. So we went out and looked. We looked at two or three different little towns in North Carolina and found one in Farmville, North Carolina, 13 miles uh, uh, west of Greenville and Pitt County and big tobacco markets and, and all that kind of thing. A little, nice little town. And we bought the radio station for uh, $8,000 down payment and financed 29,000 to the fellow who made tobacco cures, who owned the station. And what was his name? Florence Mayo. Uh, his name was Mr. Mayo. Can't remember his first name, but it was the Florence Mayo Tobacco Cures. Wow. And so every year for, I have to go pay my finance costs, but bought the station, a little AM station. And you had a partner. And had a partner. And, um, and that was Gene Gray. No, it was before Gene Gray. Well, before Gene. Gene Gray was our engineer. Oh, okay. And uh, Lawrence Bear was one of our announcers and also an engineer. So I had two engineers, which was really nice. Yeah. And then I had another fellow who was our sales manager, Tommy Bullock, and uh, my partner and I. And we'd both go out and sell. Now, he did the morning show uh, every morning. I did the uh, noontime country music block. In those days, different kinds of music, different times of the day. So I was playing country music every day at noon time. Had some good sponsors. Who was your biggest time. advertiser? Uh, probably the Farmville Furniture Company. They are still in business today. That's right. <clears throat> wow. That's right. And they were your biggest advertiser. Yeah. Now let's tell people, what were the call letters of that station? Go ahead and take a drink. We'll cut that part out. Um, so, let's talk yeah. about the Farmville Station. Well, what were the call letters of the Farmville Station? We bought the station that had some crazy call letters. They were almost like the Greenville Radio Station's call letters. And we made a deal that we would change our call letters. So the slogan of the town was watching the Farmville area grow. So we got the call letters W, F, A, G. Watching the Farmville area grow. W fag. Uh -huh. and, and that, that kind of had a double meaning. Well, and not at that time. Because a fag in those days was a cigarette yeah. in, in England. And what we did is we took the G and we put a, a cigarette across there and the smoke go up and that was our logo. Great logo. And people that read the uh, comic strips knew that a fag was a cigarette. So here we were in a big tobacco market and we were fag radio. About three or four years later, I got a phone call from an ad agency in New York City. 
I said, wow, this is great. I might get some, some big time uh, some, uh, contracts. And the guy says, hello, this is uh, George. Uh, is uh, your radio station really fag radio? <laughs> I said, yes. And he goes, hey guys, it's true. It's fag radio. They are laughing and all that kind of thing. <laughs> Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what that, how it came out. I said, what's the matter with that? That's a cigarette in England. He said, yeah, yeah, but uh, um, in New York City and all these places, a fag is a, you know, a queer. <laughs> That's first I knew that. And uh, so at that point in time, we had, didn't have problems, but we kept at any rate and uh, went on for a number of years, and finally they changed the call letters after I left. <laughs> well, how long were you at uh, uh, KFAG? Uh, WFAG. Oh, excuse me, WFAG. WFAG. WFAG, Fag yes. Radio. Watching uh, the Farmville yeah. area grow. I was there from 1960 to 1972. Okay. And yeah. what happened in 1972? Well, I had a real good friend. His name was Wade Hargrove, and he and I had been together and talked about things and the, I was the president of the Broadcast Association in 1970 and I was on the board and Wade and I got together about things and whatever and and it was time for me to leave Farmville just time um, so I got a call from him one day he said Carl I just uh, I just talked to the president or the chairman of Durham Life Broadcasting and they're looking for someone to Replace Dick Mason, who's going to retire after about 50 years, and who, by the way, was the first president of the NCAB back in 1947 or so. And uh, I put your name up. I said, you did? He said, yeah. And I gave you a good recommendation. Pretty soon I got a call to go interview. I went up there and interviewed. He got the job. So... I sort of helped Wade Hargrove get his job in Raleigh at the NCAB, and he got me a good job as president of Durham Life Broadcasting. So that's 1972. 72. All right, so in 1972, what were the broadcast assets of Durham Life Broadcasting? WPTF radio and... 50,000 clear watt. Yeah, yeah. And a 100,000 watt FM station called WPTF FM, which was doing nothing as they all were just playing classical music. FMs were not really yeah. in, in vogue at that time. It just really wasn't there. I mean, it, but now, let, let me go back a minute. I have to tell you this. In 1969, I applied for an AM and an FM station in New Bern, because I was still in Farmville, and there was an open frequency there, AM. There was an FM, but you know, I kind of went along with it. So I applied and, and got it and uh, put together a, the AM station in Newburn, and put the transmitter in a trailer, put a tower up, and then the FM started making some movement. So I brought in a friend who had uh, worked for me in Farmville and who was in Detroit working for ABC, and he said, look, why don't you put some popular music on it? You know, not, not necessarily rock and roll, but pop music on the FM. And I did. And then I got the call from Durham Life to come up to Raleigh. So the station was doing so well, though, because we went up on the Channel 12's TV tower and everybody was listening. So the station had value all of a sudden. The AM was okay, but not a big deal. So I sold it. And what were the call letters for that station? Do you remember um, where it was on the dial? It was a 106.5 on the on the FM dial, and I th can't remember the AM frequency. What did a station like that sell for in those days? Well, I think I got a hundred and ten thousand dollars. Wow, a lot of money at that time. It was, yeah, yeah, it sure was. Yeah, especially especially what we well we had no. Hadn't invested too much, but here's what happened to us, and the reason that became a good situation. My engineer, Lawrence Bear, who 
has a successful big engineering consulting company to this day, LBA, went to Washington to talk about our FM, which was only 3,000 watts. And we didn't think much of it. He went up there and he, got, he started talking to some people in the commission. And they did this and did that. And he came back and said, guess what? They gave us a Class C. We're now going to be 100,000 watts. And, and I've never known to say how we got it. It just was done. So that helped give it value, of course. Then, yeah. I went to, then I went to Raleigh. Wow. So at that time, Durham Life Broadcasting had two stations. Two stations. And uh, a powerhouse AM, which was very valuable, and also an FM yeah. with the same call letters. Yeah. But not so big at that time. Yeah. But, and they were still smarting over the fact that they lost a big hearing at the FCC to get Channel 5. In other words, the uh, fight was a fight between the Fletchers, who just owned a 250-watt AM radio station, and big Durham Life Insurance Company had a 50,000-watt NBC station, and uh, they, they thought surely the commission would award Channel 5 to them, Durham Life Insurance Company, but the, the Fletchers got it, and that's how they started WRAL. And in those days, radio stations were uh, visibly affiliated with the network names that you might oh, yeah, sure, imagine yeah. as being TV networks now. Yeah. But they were radio networks. They yeah. were affiliated with NBC. And, and, and as a matter of fact, before I got there, they had already bought some television equipment and uh, were rehearsing studio production and whatever, then didn't get the channel. Mm -hmm. So they were sort of smarting over that. So, and WPTF was doing okay, but the FM was not. Well, I called my friend in Detroit again. I said, I got to do something with this station. He said, well, I'll tell you what we, you need to do. So I've got a, a young guy here at the ABC station, and he is only about 17, 18 years old. He has done more research about music and what people and what the, what the younger demographics want, and he wants to put it on the air in Detroit. And they won't let him. I said, "Well, I'm interested in it because my own 16-year-old son said, Dad, everybody, my high school and over at NC State and Carolina, all listening to all these new groups like the Rolling Stones and the Grateful Dead and all these groups." And I'm sort of saying, "Who?" And so I called Lee Abrams, went to Detroit, convinced him to come to Raleigh, and convinced him after a couple of trips to come in and be our consultant and program our station. And we took the call letters and changed them to WQDR. And this is the FM. FM. Mm -hmm. WPTF FM became WQDR. QDR. And about what year would that be? That would be 1973. Three. All right. And so you programmed it, and what kind of music did you play? We played just what I would describe. In those days, it was album rock radio. And nobody was doing that. Well, the college stations were playing some of it. Mm -hmm. And the kids were buying it. You know, behind the albums, right? And all these groups were coming in. I mean, even the there was and other people called it hard rock, whatever. Even Elton John was considered a hard rock artist in those days. But we, but Lee had this programming uh, uh, formula that he developed. He had hitchhiked all over Florida and watched people tune their radios to what kind of music. And he found that everybody was dissatisfied with what they call bubblegum music or the beautiful music, you know, of the, of the past and, of course, classical music. So he devised this uh, programming, which was really well done, put it on the air, and within almost one year, out of 14 radio stations, WQDR was tied for the number one station. And in fact, uh, the benefit of looking back, uh, WQDR was the first 
album-oriented rock station format in the country. In the country. You, and one that took off like a rocket. Yeah. So Lee formed his own consulting. I wish I had, wish I had been his partner, but at any rate, <laughs> I couldn't do it. And I sent him down to Atlanta, to some friends down there, and he programmed the Atlanta station. And they went to Chicago, and then from there he went all over the country, and all these these stations went on the air. New York City came on later, and Lee became very very wealthy, and uh, then he he teamed up with another uh, consultant. So that's how it started. Wow. Now WPTF in the meantime, AM was now having that challenge of what happens to AM stations. Now we had talk shows on, but we had the fairness doctrine. And so I, I put on a, a talk show at night, I think it was one of the first talk shows in the state really, uh, television call-in talk shows, they had a 10 second delay. But we had to be real careful because of the fairness doctrine. You couldn't talk about politics, couldn't talk about religion, couldn't talk about anything that was confrontational. When we did, we had to go out, and I had to go out and find somebody that could come in, be on the air the next day, and talk about the, the opposing view. That's what the fairness doctrine. So if you presented one side of the issue, it, you became obligated to have someone come in yeah. and present the other side yeah. to be able to uh, uh, maintain your yeah. uh, compliance with regulatory rules. And that killed, that, that really killed talk radio. Um, until President Reagan was elected. What happened then? Well, and Wade Hargrove can correct me on the timing of this. Uh, a lot of the regulations were then moved and the fairness doctrine was eliminated. Then people like Rush Limbaugh came on the air and all those talk shows because they didn't have to worry about the fairness doctrine. They didn't have to have somebody come in exactly. the next day to counter what they had yeah, said. Yeah. So they could be yeah. as far left or as far right as they wanted to be, attract that audience and they that's didn't right. have any kind of um, obligation. And that saved AM radio in the United States, I'm convinced. And that was eliminating the fairness doctrine. Exactly. And that was under Reagan. Because suddenly Rush Limbaugh came on at noontime. Um, I was at a, uh, a meeting in New York with the president of ABC Radio. And he announced to our group, he said, I've got a new idea. I've got a guy who's out there and right now in uh, California. Great, great host. His name is Rush Limbaugh, and he, I mean, he has turned Sacramento into a new town. And I'm going to put him on a, net, uh, a private network. I'm not going to put him on ABC, and he did. And Rush Limbaugh went on all the stations, our stations included. And at that point in time, all the, all the AM stations survived for that reason. And then other, others came on, of course. Um, so it was a... It was, it was a, a really a, a great time, and Wade Hargrove was involved as a, a communications attorney of helping get rid of all these onerous FCC regulations. They were terrible. For example, when you had a rating book, a radio rating book going on, you were prohibited by the FCC from doing any kinds of promotions. You can do any special promotions, no giveaways, nothing, which was crazy. Um, if you wanted to own a radio station, you had to show that you had enough operating capital to operate the station for a full year with no income whatsoever. Crazy. And in fact, many of the banks helped people buy stations by sending letters that said we would help you, but they were illegal. But there were a lot of regulations that, that went on that we had to get rid of that was just they're onerous, and we, we're constantly having to to decide how you're gonna, who you're gonna employ, and it really, really hurt. And people like Wade Hargrove, NCAB, and then the NAB uh, uh, got rid of those. In the meantime, I was uh, elected to the National Association of Broadcasters Board of Directors. And when, what year would that have been? Um, I was there from 
72 or 3, I think, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And I became vice president for radio for the National Association of Broadcasters. And at that time, we began to really fight the regulatory system of the FCC. And it was a big effort. And I think we were pretty successful. As I say, I gave Ronald Reagan so much credit because when he became president um, in 82, he eliminated so many problems for us. For example, you didn't have to have, uh, 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 you could move your, the FM transmitter and towers to, to other locations nearby, still serve the same city. That's where all the big Class C FM started. And that was a, that was a big thing. But getting rid of those regulations was really important. I was telling somebody this morning that I ran across a transcript that I read, I uh, testified before a Senate committee about the FCC regulations. Another, uh, another man, Lowry Mays, who formed Clear Channel Radio, now it's iHeart, he and I testified about what the regulations were doing to us. And obviously yeah. it had an impact. It, yeah, I think so. And then we also, at that point in time, were pushing to allow more ownership of more stations. And that went through also. So what did Durham Life think about you running their stations now after these improvements and changes? Well, they were fine. But then, a lawyer from uh, Durham had started a UHF station over in Durham, Chapel Hill, Channel 28, a UHF station. He had an NBC aff affiliation, but very, very weak signal, uh, small tower, barely couldn't cover the market. So I saw an opportunity there to get Durham Life Broadcasting, their TV station. And there was no NBC TV station in that size market that you could really watch, just ABC and CBS. So we bought the station and um, put it on the air, built a, what a 2,000 foot tower, but a 1,800 foot tower, sort of in the center of the market, and then covered the market. Um, and then went on the air and did our own news competed with 5 and 11. What were the call letters for that station? WPTF-TV. It was WPTF-TV. Uh, Wade Hargrove and I went to the FCC and Wade convinced the commissioners that we'd be allowed, first of all, to buy the station and to attach our AM call letters to it. And they let us do it. Oh. Yeah. And, and based on some valid facts, too. Not not just salesmanship. And that was good, and that, that got us going. And uh, so now we had AM, FM, and TV. And about what year did the TV station come on, do you remember? Uh, 78, okay. is, is my recollection. All right, so now you've got an AM, an FM, and an NBC TV, affiliate. Uh, TV station. Wow. So that was good, and the company was, was, was growing. Now, of course, we had to compete with really two great established TV stations, VHF. And we were UHF, and cable was not quite in place yet. So we had to go around town and give away UHF TV antennas. So people could get your station? Yeah, so we, we took them to the grocery stores and said, put them in the bag. And we had to promote the fact that you got this antenna, put it on your TV set, now you can watch NBC. Wow. And then soon, uh, Time Warner uh, signed on. Uh, full, and we got on cable. You got carried. So when cable yeah, came yeah, along, you yeah. had carriage and it yeah. carried your signal to people that couldn't get it before so that. That solved the problem. Wow. Well, what happened after that? Um, one of the things that Wade and I had to promise the FCC was that we would provide all the services that a television station should provide, which included news. In other words, just like any other TV station, which we agreed to do. Of course, that was expensive, and we did it. 
and you know that cost us a lot of money. We weren't making any, the money to begin with. I think we would have, but the company decided they didn't want to spend the money on on the news. And even though I told them, I said, you know, if we stop it, we might be in violation of what we promised the FCC. So uh, I agreed to to re resign because they didn't want me to to run it if I wasn't going to uh, and, and run the news. So at that point in time, though. It was a good situation because the rules had changed about ownership. And then my friend Wade Hargrove came to my uh, uh, rescue again and told me about a radio station that I could buy over in High Point. And um, so I formed a company, uh, Voyager Communications, and went and made a deal with the owner of that at that station and uh, began to accumulate some stations with a partner, Jack McCarthy, who joined me. What year was that that you bought your first station then, High uh, Point? 1982. 1982, you and Jack. Mm -hmm. Great. And what followed after that? What other stations? Uh, well, we had the F AM and FM there. And then uh, Wade Hargrove and his partners had bought an AM FM station in Wilson, North Carolina. He was in the broadcast business, which was good. And he promised me that he might sell us the station at some point in time. And um, so when we got our High Point station and we made it a triad, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, High Point, because we went up on Channel 2's TV tower and put a signal, uh, an FM signal, of our High Point FM all over the So triad. Channel 2, was that WFMY? Yes, uh-huh, mm -hmm. yeah. So we had a good signal, and our station over there did jump right to the top. It's called Magic 99.9. And what's, uh, what format did you have there? It was uh, a little contemporary. Okay. And we had uh, George Francis was the manager, then Dick Harlow became our manager. Dick, I hired Dick as our sales manager, and when George left, Dick became our general manager, and he stayed there for, for a good, good while. So, Voyager Communications continued to grow. Yeah. So, Wade made a deal to, to buy the stations from, from, from Wade Hargrove and his partners, and we moved their FM close to Raleigh, so it would cover both Wilson and the Raleigh-Durham market, and put a, a station on that was we call it WRDU, which is perfect because those call letters were available to us. So uh, that was kind of tricky. We had to, again, convince people who protested uh, that, we, you know, that this would be okay, and we got the station on the air. And what we did is we decided, well, WQDR, which I had left, still rock and roll or album rock. Well Don Curtis had taken over as the, pre the uh, uh, vice president of Durham Life Broadcasting at the time. He followed me. Now Don wanted, plus one of the other officers of Durham Life Insurance Company, they didn't like the rock and roll, they wanted country music. So they wanted to put country music on WQDR. Well Don and I got together, sort of, and we sort of threatened each other a little bit. I said, Don, I'm gonna put my old format on WRDU up against you, but why don't you go ahead and change the country? That's what you wanna do, and, 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 and need a country format in the market. So we got together, and one day at six o'clock, we uh, got Channel 11 TV to cover us, and we made the switch. He switched the country, and we turned on our wow. album rock. Yeah. Wow. About what year was that then? That was uh, uh, eighty-three. Wow. Well, that's quite a coup. Yeah. So that worked out great for Don, and Darren Life Broadcasting. That Don later left and came back and bought, you know, those stations, and it was good for us. WRDU did very well. We, we sort of took over the the format that we had had, 
And um, then from there, um, decided to expand. And Jim Goodman had built a UHF TV station in uh, Charlotte, outside of Charlotte. And he had an, AM sta an FM station that went with it. But he was interested in the UHF station. He wanted the TV but didn't care much about the radio. Well, sort of, yeah. And we were at a cocktail party together one night, right near where we are right this minute. And we're talking, and Jim said, well, I'll sell you the FM station if you keep your, if you put the antenna up on my tower, pay me rent. So I made a deal that night, and we bought uh, the station, moved it from uh, uh, to Charlotte, it was in Statesville, moved it to Charlotte and put it on the air. Didn't have an AM, we just had the, uh, the FM. And um, if you want me to go on about... What were the call letters there? Uh, it was a WMG, it was a takeoff from Magic. We already had Magic 99 in Greensboro. Right. So this is WMYG. And it was uh, basically uh, kind of an oldie station yeah. at that time. So now you're in the Charlotte market. So now we're in the Charlotte market. Charlotte, High Point, mm -hmm. uh, the Wilson TV station is now covering Raleigh. Raleigh, Raleigh Durham, Capitol right. Hill. Right. Yeah, and then yeah. you've got um, uh, some other things that you got going. Well, then we decided that um, uh, Don Curtis had made a good haul putting an urban station on in Durham and sold it for a lot of money. And urban stations were just now coming into play. So we were down in Greenville, South Carolina, Greenville, Spartanburg, and there was a, a station for sale down there and didn't have an urban format. So we bought the station, put an urban format on it, and then, but it was a lower power FM, so we bought another station in uh, Spartanburg I had two stations and did simultaneous programming. So that gave you the coverage that you yeah, needed for right. the single urban yeah. format. Yeah. And so that, that did well for a number of years. It did do great, but it did, it did fine. Urban format, formatting was difficult. I mean, there's a lot of music that a lot of the African-American audience didn't want to hear than they did. It was hard to, to program it, but, but it was needed. And uh, as a matter of fact, we did well enough that Jesse Jackson called us and wanted us to come up. He wanted to buy our radio station because he grew up in Greenville, South Carolina, and he would love to have had a radio station down there that played very music. So I visited Jesse Jackson and we talked and we never didn't make a deal. Uh, but uh, at any rate, it, so it was successful that way. So we, we decided, well, South Carolina is pretty good. And then soon after, the old time station in, uh, in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, became available. AM and FM. Well, what happened there? We bought them and, uh, and overpaid for them. Overpaid. <laughs> but that's okay. They were, they were tough to operate. We operated and we did well. What are the call letters there? Uh, I forget the one station, I think it was uh, uh, CSC. Nice market though. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, nice town. And we were right there at the university and my station manager had played basketball for Frank McGuire in South Carolina and so we were in, that was really good. I enjoyed, enjoyed having that station. You just keep growing. Well, at that time, now we at a point where we're getting into some days that uh, everybody was having a, a pretty tough time. Even our friend George Beasley had bought a station in, in Charlotte. And uh, the bank made George Beasley give up his station. Really? They, they wanted us to give up our station. We ended up selling it. And George Beasley said, wait a minute, um, I'm, in the, I'm in the business. But the, the bank said, sorry. And George Beasley went out to L.A., found some financing, and bought an L.A. station for about $60 million and sold it three years later for $90 million. 
from there on, George Beasley formed Beasley Broadcasting and bought a lot of radio stations. All because he was told he had to sell a station that he had. In, in Charlotte, yeah. yeah. Wow. So that crisis uh, created another opportunity. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, th at this point in time, my partner and I, we were kind of decided, well, we've, we've got these stations. Now the big groups were being formed, Clear Channel. Well, they're buying stations now because they had to buy a lot of stations and they're paying the, the prices for them. So we kind of decided maybe we should sell. And we did. So we sold our whole group to what was the beginning of a clear channel group. And what year was that? That was 94. 94. Wow. How many stations did you have at that time? We had, that was, uh, and that group was uh, 10 stations. 10 stations? What'd you do then? Well, at that point in time, I was a big seller, <laughs> did everything to do, so I moved to Riceville Beach. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, was there, and because some of my children were there, and I had a new grandchild, and whatever, that was a good thing to do. But I was there for about two or three years, and my son-in-law, father of one of my grandchildren, came up to me and said, he was a stockbroker, said, there's a radio station here in Wilmington for sale. I'd love to go in there with you and you show me how to run it and, and I'll do all the work. So we bought the radio station. I bought it at an FM and an AM. And then we bought another FM. So we had three stations in Wilmington. And they did, and that's where I had John Boy and Billy uh, today. And I was talking to them. They, Remember that, and I said to the, their table, I said, uh, John Boy and Billy made me a lot of money, and they did, because they, they, they thought that was sounded great. So that must have been in their initial days of syndicating and early getting on. stations, yeah, very early, early on. Mm -hmm. early you were stage. an early adopter. Yeah, Got so that. we were one of their first stations, and boy, it took our station number one in no time. John Boy and Billy. Wow. Then I had an AM talk station, and, uh, and then we ran those, and then um, Johnny Harris from Charlotte, that was a big landowner, investor, decided he wanted to own some radio stations, so he bought two of our stations. I kept an FM and made it a smooth jazz format, which was very experimental because there were no smooth jazz stations in Raleigh, Charlotte, anywhere except that on the West Coast. So I made Smooth Jazz FM. And it did okay to a time where I got tired of, of having to find people because in those days you had to be sure that you had the right percentage of minority uh, employees commensurate with the percentage of the people who lived in your market. I think the 50% of the same percentage. It got to be very difficult. So I said, let's sell it. So we did, and I retired from the radio business. But then I had one more uh, really interesting time. Uh, in 95, I was asked by the, the uh, US government, US Information Agency, to go to Israel and to help the Palestinians build their first radio and TV station. The accords had just been signed between the Israelis and the Palestinians and everything was on a peaceful mode. Part of the accords said that Israel would give up one TV channel and one FM radio channel and give it to the Palestinians because the Palestinians had no broadcast at all. So I went and stayed for a number of weeks and met with the Palestinian Broadcast Board of Directors, very smart men, very knowledgeable, good businessmen, and basically led them through how to get their first radio station started and TV. Uh, the problem was money. France was giving them money. The United States was giving practically nothing. But the USIA was working on getting them more money. And uh, when I left, then I went back a year and a half later, 
and they had built the radio station, and they had built the station in Jericho. I had shown them how to do talk radio, and so they had talk radio, and of course that was great with the situation, because Palestinians and Israelis alike could call in and complain and talk and talk politics, no fairness doctrine going on over there. And that was really very satisfying. I went in there and they were, had all this talk radio going. Now, the Israelis still controlled everything, controlled the power, whatever. And they had also then built about four hours of television time a day. And I took a team with me from Charlotte, in Greenville to uh, work with a television group to show the one sales and how to do basically production. And they were doing it fairly well, but we were putting them on a commercial basis, selling commercials. And then Al Jazeera came into play and that, that sort of quit it. And also Yasser Arafat was down in the Gaza Strip and he was, he was not sharing the money uh, for the stations up in the West Bank. And the stations did well until the next Infantata when the Israelis tanks came into Ramadan where the TV station was. And I was watching television one night and the announcer was saying, here are the Israeli tanks going down the main street of Ramadan, which is just north of Jerusalem. And there's the building. I said, that's the TV station building. And all of a sudden, the tanks go off and they blew the whole thing to smithereens. What uh, years would have that, that been that you were you know, went over and helped with that project? That was uh, 95 and then again, 97. I may be off a little bit there. Wow. Interesting experience. Yeah, that was fun. That was really, it was very interesting. I mean, being around all that, I knew nothing about any of it. And the Palestinian Authority, at the time, is before they got into a lot of their terrorism situation. But at the same time, I learned a lot of things that, uh, and, and I learned a lot of why they were not, they were getting treated the way they were being mm -hmm. treated. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know, I lost contact with their, with their board, and uh, then, some, you know, Hamas came in and it's been a different situation. So what project did you get involved in after that? Um, I think that was about it. Well, Carl, tell us a couple of interesting stories from your broadcast days. You have one story you've told me that I like uh, about uh, operators and one particularly about Bill Robertson and his station in Washington, North Carolina, and his entertaining of uh, national media buyers that helped his business. Well, that's really interesting. Bill Robertson, who owned WITN Channel 7 for many, many years, started. Um, he was trying to figure out, as people like myself in a little old Farmville, how to get Eastern North Carolina market recognized, to get national advertising business. Because we were, no, we were nothing, we were nobody. Channel 9, WNCT TV was on the air at the time too. Newburn had not come on at the time. And WNCT was Roy Park's first TV Roy station. Park, yes. yes. And so the whole thing was fighting to get some of those national dollars. I wouldn't get any of my radio station, but anyway, uh, Bill Robertson, who was a real big promoter, in fact, when he was the president of the NCAB when I was on the board, we'd go to a meeting and we'd all get in a line of cars, 30, 40, 50 cars, and we'd take a tour of wherever we were, mostly around the Outer Banks, around Little Washington, and out in Hyde County, showing off all the beauty of that land. <laughs> and Bill was just great at that. So what he would do, he would invite the big time buyers of the big ad agencies in New York, Chicago, to come down to see the area and go on his boat. Now the boat was the attraction, big boat. He had a 48 footer, I think, yacht, and go fishing. And they'd all land in Raleigh-Durham. You could land in those days in Kinston, Greenville, and Newburn, but <laughs> he had them all land in uh, Raleigh-Durham. And he'd send his cars up, and he had that fleet of green yellow cars. And he'd have a bar set up at the trunk. 
and they'd pick up the time buyers, put them in the car, start make, mixing them drinks. I mean, I think I think we were in dry, dry county at the time, at any rate. But he'd mix the drinks, take them to Washington, put them up in some of the nicer homes uh, in Washington, and then take them out to his uh, fish camp and did, did that whole thing, put them on his big boat, take them all around, whatever, of three or four days or five days, and then I'm sure made presentations about the market, trying to sell Eastern North Carolina as a viable uh, DMA market. And it, it didn't work for the most part. I mean, people, they began to recognize that. And, uh, and Bill was, he was just one of those kind of guys that could do all that kind of thing. He made money. Yeah, he did. And Channel 9 benefited from it also. Mm -hmm. And the rest of then, then uh, Channel 12, Newburn came on the air. So the Eastern North Carolina market, as you'd certainly know, was you had to fight for it because there's really no big, big cities and no big population areas. You uh, also told us a story about when you were, uh, told me a story one time about when you were in college and the fact that, uh, uh, or you were, maybe you were working at UNC TV, but um, you, uh, it was, all the counties were dry and you had trouble finding the adult beverages that you needed. Oh, well, that was back uh, when I was an undergraduate. How did that work? Uh, yeah. You were going to UNC Chapel Hill. Yeah. I, was, I worked there as a student, but I was also a member of a fraternity. And then the most important thing that for the fraternities was to have a good stash of booze for the weekends. <laughs> and Orange County, you would see, was dry. So we would have to drive over to Durham, where they had ABC stores, and load up the car. <laughs> And that's that was that was your uh, initiation to how to drink responsibly. I see that was your weekly run. Yeah, exactly. To Durham. That's right. Hmm. Hmm. But uh, the other stories, though, they might find interesting. Back at my little radio station in Farmville, and the town was really little, and the station was small, and you know, I did. A, I began doing the morning show myself with my partner left. He and I bought a radio station at Fuquay Varina, right outside of south of Raleigh. And he left to go up there, and he and I owned Farmville and Fuquay Varina. So I took over the morning show. I would do that all morning and then go sell. But you did all these really funny things. It was all live. I had a guy who was an afternoon disc jockey. I think he had finished the eighth grade. And all the different stories about the things that are said on the air while being so live. Like uh, the president of Mexico, he's reading the news. The pre president of Mexico has just died from acute cerebral hemorrhoid. <laughs> <laughs> Things like that. And then you and I, every morning at nine o'clock, we had the Farmville Funeral Home obituary column of the air. <laughs> so we put the music, the organ music on come on, I'd say, and now the Farmville Funeral Home presents the obituary column of the air. And one morning I went thinking, I said, I'm sorry to report there's no obituaries this morning. <laughs> the phones rang. <laughs> so, and all those kinds of things back in those days. Did you have any live music on your stations? Uh, on Sunday mornings, yes. You did have live music? Yeah, and we, and we had, you know, some religious programs too. Really just music, mm -hmm. live music. And you had mentioned Jacksonville. You know, that area was a hotbed of a cappella groups in those days. And I didn't know if there was any live performers or any shows that you had. Um, you know, WITN used to have uh, uh, a rock and roll show and uh, for, for the, the Afro African American uh -huh. uh, groups. And then they had Teen Canteen for the uh, uh, Caucasian folks to come in. And that's, it was kind of separate but unequal. And uh, Jacksonville was a hotbed of African-American uh, groups. And I didn't know if you had any of that or not. No, I did not at my stations, but uh, yeah. being from Jacksonville, I was aware of it, mm -hmm. of course. 